Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Modern international relations are a direct result of a series of treaties ratified in Westphalia during the 17th century. The Westphalian peace enshrined the rights of states to claim sovereignty over their domestic affairs and territories, and thus promoted the fundamental principle that all states, no matter how weak or powerful, are equal in international law. The advent of the West has made these Westphalian principles the global norm of international affairs, and Asia is no exception. What is often forgotten, however, is that Asia, before the arrival of the Western powers, was under a fundamentally different system. In effect, a hierarchical order in which China held the highest position. Thanks to its might and advanced Confucian culture, China was at the center of a system where there could be no equality among nations. Yet, where emulation and cooperation were possible, trade thrived, and importantly, stability could be found. This is the argument of Professor David Kong, who kindly agreed to be our guest for this episode. Together, we look back into the ancient regional order of pre-modern Asia and explore whether the history of Asian international relations can inform us as to the present state of affairs in the region, and maybe even help us make sense of China's rise. David Kang is Professor of International Relations and Business at the University of Southern California. He is also Director of the Korean Studies Institute and the East Asian Studies Center. Professor Kang's latest book is East Asia Before the West, Five Centuries of Trade and Tribute. He is also author of numerous articles in top academic journals and has also written opinion pieces in major newspapers. He received an AB with honors from Stanford University and his PhD from Berkeley. Professor David Kang, welcome to Korea and the World. Uh, delighted to be here. Jumping right in, in your university profile, you state that one of your research interests is the historical basis of contemporary international relations. What does that mean? And how do you think this can inform our thinking about current affairs? What it means is the way that we behave now and the way that we think about the world now uh, has historical roots. And particularly for East Asia, I'm, I'm very interested in what those historical roots are because those of us in America, when we study IR, we only study European history and we never study Asian history. And so I'm interested in what the Asian history might have and whether it has any impact on how we think about the world today. You mentioned European IR. A word that comes up frequently is Westphalian. The system is Westphalian. You know, the, the, the contemporary world that we live in today is made up of nation states and uh, everybody in the world has jumped into a nation state. And that's the most important actor thing in international relations. And this system that grew out of a series of treaties of Westphalia back in you know, 1648, so what, three, four hundred years ago in Europe, when they began to try and decide who got to be a nation and who didn't. By the time we get up to the present, what we have is the Westphalian nation state system is based on formal equality. So all countries are the same. Once you're a country, you're the same. There's informal inequality. A lot of countries are clearly not as important as the United States. But the idea of equality and the importance of equality is almost unquestioned when we think about international relations. But it still grows out of a particular time and place. But that was not the case in pre-modern Asia, was it? Well, exactly. And that's what has me particularly interested. The nation-state system in pre-modern Asia wasn't built on formal equality. In fact, it was built on formal inequality, where countries were ranked, often according to how Confucian they were. But you had countries that were higher up on the hierarchy and lower on the hierarchy. Uh, and you had a vast variety of different political systems. So it wasn't simply countries like Korea, Japan. You had tribes and, and Mongols and, and Churchins. And so it was a very different system that's based on formal inequality, but that allowed a lot of informal equality. Once you knew your place in the system, uh, the top dog, usually China, tended to leave the smaller countries alone. Could you please define the word hierarchy um, in this context? Yeah, I think a hierarchy is simply uh, a rank order in which some are higher on the hierarchy and some are lower. 
And you can have that be any number of things. Particularly, I think, we, we tend to think in terms of a status hierarchy, where some were considered more civilized and others less civilized. But I want to point out, even today, we have a lot of informal hierarchy. Because every single time you hear the word leadership, we need American leadership. America must be a leader. We're talking about hierarchy because leaders have to have followers. And the two are different. One has different expectations than the other. But in that system, can we really talk about states being independent? Were they not just vessels or colonies of China? Well, that's where I think it gets really interesting. Because when you think of the countries that were deeply in the hierarchy, probably the two closest were Vietnam and Korea, both of which had independent governments that made all their domestic choices all by themselves. Uh, that would report to China, they'd send uh, missions back and forth, which were used for a bunch of things, learning, education, diplomacy, spying, as well as formally uh, you know, letting the emperor, the Chinese emperor, know what was going on. So a lot of uh, relations between the two. But Korea was basically left alone to make all the decisions that it wanted to. And in fact, Korea was also, and Vietnam were left alone, to make other types of tribute relations with other types of political units, the Jurchens up to the north, the Japanese to the east, uh, Yukyu to the south. Uh, so in that sense, I think you can really talk about them as independent political entities, as independent countries, sure. Is it fair to say that China's position at the apex of that system was actually thanks to its status, that was the core element of its hegemony? Well, I think there's a couple things. Number one, it was obviously the richest and most powerful. There's no question about it, right? I mean, China's huge. China's huge today, but more than simple power, material power, more than simply being the biggest or the richest, it was because of its civilization. Well, the best, the best way I can describe historical China is this. It's the way that the United States is today, which is we don't have to like America. <laughs> you don't have to ever visit America, but we all know if you speak English, you know, you have an advantage in your own country. And in fact, If you can have gone and studied in America, and if you can speak English fluently, and you know about American ideas and values, you have not only a sort of pride and status, but you have a real material advantage in your own home country, in almost every country around the world. So that's partly because America is rich and, and powerful, but it's also because of the ideals that America has and the, and the values that it espouses. In the same way, China was the source of civilization in historical East Asia. Whether countries bought in, such as Korea, Vietnam, and to a lesser extent Japan, or Yukus, or Siam, or whether they rejected it almost totally, such as the Mongols, you had to react to or deal with China. And the way that you can know that it's also like, uh, it's more than simple power is this. The Mongols conquered China, but Mongolia didn't become the center of the universe. China did. The Manchus later on conquered China. Manchuria didn't become the center of the universe. China did. China sat at the top of a series of interrelationships that weren't transposable. Even Hideyoshi, when he tried to invade uh, during the Imjin Wera, it wasn't to make Japan the center of the universe. It was to conquer China and for him to then become uh, the emperor at the top of the, at the hierarchy. And so there's a real difference there in the country. They're not transposable. In your 2010 book, East Asia Before the West, you explained that a subgroup of East Asian states constituted a Confucian society. What, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that these countries, particularly Korea and Vietnam, who were considered you know, closest to China, to a lesser extent Japan, at times Yukus, etc., a number of these countries, viewed themselves as being engaged in a similar cultural social, political, theological process as being part of the same conversation about what it meant to be a country. And they viewed each other as engaged in the same project. They learned from each other. Mostly they tried to learn from China, but the exchange of scholars back and forth, the exchange of ideas, the borrowing of ideas. When I talk about a Confucian society, I don't mean uh, simply learning poetry and uh, calligraphy. What I mean is that China and civilization was viewed as practical solutions to many practical problems. So that Chinese language was imported uh, throughout the region. 60 to 70 percent of Japanese language is Chinese homophones, as is Korean and Vietnamese. The governmental form 
of China, the six ministries was copied. And most importantly, throughout the region, probably the key idea that these countries shared was the idea of the scholar uh, official, the literati, where you would take an exam and you would study the classics and that the government should be run by an examination system selected on merit, not on, not on heredity. So that's what I mean by societies. They genuinely thought that they were engaged in the same project. But whereas you use the word tributary system to talk about the East Asian uh, world order, to say, you use the term society for the Confucian society. Why is that? What's the difference? Yeah. The system was larger than the society, right? When I talk about an international system, just like Westphalia today, everybody has a nation state. And what does that entail? Everybody has a passport. Everybody has a flag and an an a national anthem that sounds like it was uh, uh, made in 1860s Vienna. Oompa, oompa. Because it probably was. That's where the ideas came from. And it's odd. We don't, even, we don't even question that these are... We don't even think that they're European ideas. But think about it for a minute. Why doesn't Korea and China have a national anthem that reflects their national music? It doesn't. It's an 1860s oompa song, right? Because they're not questioning it, right? It just is. That's what the world is. Historically, the tribute system was a set of rules and institutions and norms, particularly a recognition of inequality, a way of exchanging tribute with each other so that you could recognize and affirm an inequality that existed, uh, that, that Manchus used it, that Thai, you know, Siam used it. This was used throughout the region, this set of, ru of rules and norms. Smaller than that, was the Confucian society, and they tended to sit at the top of this hierarchy. So there are plenty of countries that engage in the tribute system in order to trade, in order to deal with each other, in order to have diplomatic relations that weren't necessarily Confucian. But clearly at the top of this hierarchy were the Confucian countries. And again, I don't mean to make too many analogies to the present, but I think it'll help explain it. Uh, you might say today, for example, that democracies would be at the top of the uh, status hierarchy, right? It's gone are the days that authoritarian countries are proud that they're authoritarian. You just don't do it anymore, right? Everybody has to claim some type of popular will, some kind of democracy. It's no longer, oh, you're democratic, I'm authoritarian. And that's the same way it was back then with Confucian society. So how did one become part of the society? Was there a standard of civilization to pass or some kind of checklist to complete? And who actually did succeed to join, well, civilization? Again, there, there's no keeping anyone out. Any, any group could try. And what's actually particularly interesting is how many did. Like, you know, a Korea and Vietnam in particular. In Japan, they tried the examination, the imperial examination system for almost 300 years before eventually it, it wore out. It just didn't work in, in Japan. But from 800 to about 1100 AD, they tried the examination system. Uh, so anyone could try. Uh, and how you got ranked on the hierarchy was by how successful you were. And something has occurred to me, which is, if you just look at the geography of a map, and here's where material power plays in, in a way it's no surprise that Korea had an easier time than Vietnam. Vietnamese tribute missions to go from Vietnam all the way up to Beijing would take them a year of travel. I mean, these were huge and very expensive and difficult to do. Korea, much, much, much closer. Korea could go three times a year. They could go back and forth and back and forth. But the Vietnamese clearly saw themselves as part of this Confucian project and wrote down records, had examination systems, organized their government the same way, and felt inferior because they weren't quite as Confucian as they wanted to and actually couldn't, couldn't dream of actually being as civilized as, say, it was in China. In a sense, is it fair to say that it was quite similar to what existed in the Greco-Roman world? Those who assimilated to the dominant culture, those who spoke the language, were civilized, while the others were barbaroi, barbarians. Sure, absolutely. And in fact, I, I talk about it in some ways. There's a great article by Yuan Fung Kong called The American Tributary System. And an example, a similar example of hierarchy today is the United States and Latin America, which is this. We're clearly at the top of the hierarchy. And if Latin American leaders come to the United States, they come to Washington, D.C., and they tell us two things. Uh, we give them a lot of money and we send them home. And if they say capitalism and democracy, we give them a boatload of money and they go home. And we don't actually care what they do. If they come to D.C. and they say communism, socialism, we usually go down and beat them up. It's very clear. I mean, it's a very similar type of system. Um, before focusing on Korea further, uh, a quick question. Was the West, and I guess in this case Europe, 
part of the system at any point in pre-modern Asia? Sure. I mean, in, in a very, very, very superficial way. What happened in the, particularly in the 19th century, in the, in the early you know, 1800s, is the UK, the McCarthy mission is famous actually in the late 18th century, showing up uh, and a total mismatch here where uh, McCarthy sent from the United Kingdom as an official emissary of the Great Britain says, I'd like to make diplomatic relations, old emperor, and you know, no understanding of the context of this. And so the emperor said, sure, if you'd like to be a vassal tributary, of course, we're happy to. And a total misunderstanding there between uh, what those relations implied. So, you know, occasionally the Portuguese would sort of play along, but never were these as uh, deeply, obviously, these were done by traitors at the distant arm of, of the various uh, European countries that never had any real practical implications for the countries back home other than to open up trading relations with, you know, with, with the, the Far East at that time. Uh, and what about South Asia, Africa, the Middle East? Were there any mm -hmm. connections? Uh, there were some trading connections, very, very rare. Uh, the famous Zhenghe missions went all the way to Africa, brought back giraffes and things. In general, this is a Southeast Asia and an East Asian trading system. I mean, one of the one of the things about this is one of the reasons countries that weren't necessarily Confucian were willing to play along is that trade was far more vibrant than we used to think. There's a view that these ancient Asian kingdoms uh, were all isolated, autarkic, and didn't trade. The only reason that we in the West think that is because Western traders had a really hard time getting into the trading system. There was a vibrant trading network going on of Chinese trader slash pirates. Everybody was sort of trader slash pirate. In those days, it's hard to tell the difference. Vibrant between Korea and, and Yukus and Japan and China and Philippines and Southeast Asia. It was just the, the Westerners, Portuguese and the Dutch in particular, had a hard time getting in. So in many ways, there were a, it was a vibrant international system composed, composed of trading, diplomacy, uh, and, and cultural relations. In practice, why did smaller states join the order and especially the Confucian society? Why did they see a benefit joining in? And specifically in the case of Korea, can we isolate a specific moment uh, when actually it joined? You can isolate times when there was intensification. Uh, but Korea, for example, under the Shilla dynasty, as far back as the 8th century, began to use the imperial examination system. Japan... Korea, Vietnam has used Chinese calligraphy, Chinese, Chinese writing forever, up until uh, the creation of Hangul. And even after Sejong and Hangul, uh, it was always considered that using Chinese showed off how sophisticated you were, and using Korean was for the women or, you know, the peasants. But if you're really educated, you'd know Chinese. Uh, again, we need to remember that this was the air that people breathed in that sense, right? And obviously we're only talking about elites now. Peasants anywhere, everywhere had no idea. But for the political and economic elites, Chinese civilization was simply the, the, the known world. Was there a side of coercion coming from China, forcing other states to join in? No. Or did they have an interest in actually... It was much more emulation than coercion, right? I mean, this again is viewed as a as an opportunity and as the best learning that was available. And in some ways, it's remarkable. And it's again, it's like America is not going around forcing other countries to learn English. There's a practical reason people learn English, and there's a status reason for people learn English. I have plenty of Korean friends who throw in the English word every now and then to show off how educated they are, right? It's just, it, it's a way of showing off. Historically, in, uh, you know, China was just simply the, uh, that was, they had the best ideas. And don't forget that it's not simply learning. Uh, there is an entire philosophical system that underpins what I'm talking about. But it's not divorced from reality. I mean, the whole idea of Confucian scholars and virtue and learning is deeply wound up in business, politics, governance, society, family relations. The same way that we can talk about Judeo-Christian values or something else in the West. They're deeply intertwined. One of the things that we should note is that this Confucian way of governing, based on merit, where you select literati based on merit, was unthinkable in Europe up until maybe the French Revolution. I mean, it was a thousand years later, maybe in the 18th century, in the French Revolution, when Europe began to move away from hereditary rule and noble rule 
and began to consider using merit as a basis for governance. So these weren't, it's not something that's simply philosophical. Literally, a thousand years earlier, China instituted the first government that was based on merit. And it was deeply followed. In Korea, you weren't allowed to take the exam in your own province so that you couldn't have nepotism or influence. You were graded uh, by people from different provinces. There were separate types of uh, examinations. Often, when you became a literati, you weren't allowed to work in your own province to keep it from being too close. I mean, an amazing attempt at creating a government and debates. If you read about the debates, the debates are incredibly modern to our ears. If we hear them debating what type of books they should read to learn, are they just learning the old masters? <laughs> you know, how do we implement merit? These are debates a thousand years ago in 8, 900 AD that we would recognize today and say, oh, I understand we're having the same debates now about how we educate our children. So is it fair to say that when Yi Song-kye decided to adopt uh, at the foundation of the mm. Joseon dynasty a very strong China position and yeah. adopted neo-Confucianist reforms, it inscribed itself in that century-long trend. Yeah, sure. I mean, that, that's probably the most intensification is, is the founding of the Joseon dynasty. Uh, before then, Goryeo, for example, had been probably about as much officially sort of Buddhist in nature as opposed to Confucian. Even now, I mean, you know, throughout Joseon, uh, Buddhists were fine. I mean, it's a very different view of religion back then. But there were Chinese ideas, and there were a bunch of indigenous ideas, there were Buddhist ideas, uh, and Joseon was one that really became neo-Confucian. They intensified Confucian practices. Even there, it took hundreds of years. And so, for example, one of the things that, and, you know, it was never pure, uh, pure Chinese. There was always uh, indigenous Korean, Vietnamese, and Japanese ideas. And one example is this. Indigenous Korea, or whatever you want to call it, native Korea, uh, didn't involve emphasis on firstborn males. Uh, women could get divorced. They would inherit equally boys and girls. And so at the same time that for hundreds of years, in eight, 900 AD, uh, you're taking a Confucian examination system, many of the social practices remained uh, non-Confucian. It was only in the 1650s, I think, that the government finally got around to enforcing the, the firstborn and enforcing uh, that girls couldn't get divorced or you know, couldn't, uh, shouldn't remarry, couldn't get divorced, and uh, weren't allowed to um, inherit equally. So in other words, the very pronounced sexism or gender division is actually very recent in the long sweep of Korean history. So yeah, even while there's deep Confucianization or, or cynicization, there remained, and there remain today, deep strands of Korean, indigenous Korean behavior and thought. And it's how these two ideas merged and melded, which is what uh, makes Korea so interesting. You wrote that, and I quote, in some ways, Korea became more Confucian than China itself. Um, how effective was that as a strategy? And did that really bolster Korea's position in Confucian society? Was it at the bottom or the top of the pyramid, um, and especially how was it in relation to other East Asian states like Japan, Vietnam? Sure. Under Chosun, they really did try and become more, more Confucian than, than China, particularly, of course, after the Qing took over. There's this, and again, there's, there's no surprise. That's one reason there was intensification uh, around the time when the Qing took over from the Ming in like early 16th, uh, 17th century, 1640s or so. Uh, Korea saw itself as the last bastion of Confucianism and practices that they'd previously been willing to put up with, uh, they decided we are now the standard bearers because the Qing aren't real Confucians. Even as the Qing adopted many of the practices of the tribute system, of Confucianism, they still remained uh, Manchu. And so Chosun decided to sort of double down on how Confucian they were going to be. Uh, so Koreans have always viewed themselves as much more sophisticated and worldwide than those Japanese who tried to learn Confucianism but couldn't really get to it. I mean, the interesting thing about Japan is uh, in Japan, the, the samurai won out over the scholars. The warriors won out over the scholars eventually. Uh, in Korea, clearly the scholars won out over the warriors. And so the uh, Koreans view themselves as being higher up on the hierarchy. Even today, I was at the Ministry of Defense, and on the wall of the meeting hall, uh, there's, in Chinese characters, in calligraphy, there's a, and I should have taken a picture of this because it's awesome, and on the wall, in Chinese uh, calligraphy, is a uh, 
there's a poem that says, uh, the strength of a nation is not measured by its arms, but by its learning. I was like, this is 2015, <laughs> All right? Now again, it doesn't mean that people believe it, but this is an ideal, the same way that we have a best set of ideals, and we never live up to them in the West. But the point is they shape how we view our, our, ourselves and our world. Did that allow Korea from benefits from any advantage when dealing with other countries? Did other countries actually behave according to the hierarchy? Well, one of the interesting things, so, so certainly it, it benefited Korea in its relations with China. Better trading relations, ease of moving back and forth, solving practical problems like where the border should be. They, they had a common vocabulary they could use. In other words, they didn't always agree, but they had a common set of expectations of vocabulary and, and ideas they could use. Uh, Korea then turned around and set up hierarchic relations with the Jurchens to the north, as I said, the Japanese to the east, and then the uh, Yukus to the south. And again, it's just simply, that was the way you did things. There wasn't, there wasn't any intellectual alternative where people said, hey, let's do it some, no, it's just sort of, this is the way we do. And they set up grading them with trading rights and access rights to Korea based on where they, where they played in the hierarchy. So they just replicated it. It seems that Japan also thought it was superior to Korea, whereas Korea obviously thought it was superior to Japan. How are the two possible? I mean, if there's a hierarchy, one has to de facto yes. be better than the other. Yeah. For, for uh, I think for the longest time, uh, Japanese were on the periphery. And so, for example, a tremendous amount of borrowing from China, not really deeply involved in the tribute system, because again, they didn't really have to. By the time you get to Hideyoshi in the 16th century, a real belief that their way was best, they're going to conquer China and everything else, right? Well, that didn't actually work. Uh, the invasion of Korea, the Imjin Weiran, was a massive failure. Obviously, it was horrifically uh, devastating to Korea, but the Japanese failed completely. And they probably would have failed completely even if China hadn't helped out Korea. I mean, this was not a campaign that was going well. So the Japanese were free to believe that they were superior to Korea, for the next couple hundred years, just sort of existed on the uh, outskirts of the tributary system. And as long as they didn't try and bother the system, then everything was fine. So in a way, both sides were able to view themselves as superior to the other side. Uh, and there's, there's some very interesting um, uh, extended debate between Korea and Japan about how, how they're going to refer to each other, uh, because there are all these different titles. And Again, this is different than it would be in the, uh, in the contemporary Westphalian era, where any head of state, prime minister, president, they're not, one's not bigger than the other. They just are. You're just a head of state, prime minister, president, uh, king, I guess, right? Whereas in East Asia, the Japanese and the Koreans cared intensely about whether it was going to be uh, Ilbon Peha, Gukka, right? Kaka, I mean, right? So... Uh, they cared intensely about the ranking of how they would refer to each other, and they eventually sort of found a way to uh, sort of indirectly refer to each other so that both could maintain a fiction that they viewed each other as superior. What I find more interesting than the question of the resolution is that they both cared about it. That's what I mean by hierarchy. Why does they say, I don't care, call me whatever you want? <laughs> they didn't. They cared intensely about it. Could you maybe in two words explain what solution they found? Uh, they found a solution where... Number one, there was only, okay, I, I, may be, I may be wrong in this, so please, anyone, don't quote me, but only about after the Imjin War of 1592 to 1598, maybe like eight diplomatic missions between the two sides over the next couple hundred years. So one of their solutions was simply just not to talk to each other very much. The second thing that they did is they worked through uh, Tsushima, and there's a lot of discussion about how the, how the island of Tsushima served this incredibly important purpose of telling the Koreans what they wanted to hear and the Japanese what they wanted to hear because they were, the, you know, the people who lived on Tsushima were the traders who benefited most from keeping trade going. So there's a lot of sort of outright um, fabrication and, oh, okay, well, that sounds good enough, you know, pretending they heard what they wanted to hear. Obviously, a core element of the tribute system were tribute missions. What were they and what role did they actually play in the system? Sure. Tribute missions were official diplomatic visits by the most important, best literati from various countries uh, that would go to another country and visit. And 
it wouldn't be just one or two guys. Usually these were hundreds of people, meaning you would have a chief diplomat from, say, the Korean king. Uh, he would bring along dozens of the top scholars from the various uh, ministries. They would, of course, have translators and, and servants and guards and, and doctors. and So these are hundreds of people that would go. And one of the ways in which you knew you were, or one of the ways in which hierarchy was, was uh, shown is the countries at the top of the hierarchy got to go more often to China. So Korea often could send like two or three a year, and they were often sending more like, oh, we'll send one to congratulate the emperor on his birthday. Vietnam got to send usually one a year or so. And what did they do? The main aspect of these is to make a formal uh, announcement to the emperor and exchange views and be questioned by the emperor. So real diplomatic uh, relations. But they would go and they would spend a month or two months in the capital of Beijing and everything would happen. There would be Korean scholars talking to Chinese scholars, talking to Vietnamese scholars. I mean, a real, again, sort of like a massive academic conference in a way uh, where they would share, share the latest ideas. Uh, there would be a lot of trying to gather information about what, what was going on in these countries. And then when the Chinese would send their tribute mission back to visit uh, in Korea, that's how they found out what was going on in these countries. That's how they realized who was doing what and what these situations were, what problems were likely to come up. So they're practical as well as symbolic in terms of affirming the different statuses. A view you oppose early on in your book is that the tribute system was only a cloak for trade, to borrow the words of John Fairbank. Yeah. Uh, why do you disagree with him when he argues that the tribute system is merely an ingenious vehicle for the creation of trade between states? Yeah, um, I think that's part of it. Clearly, as I said, one of the benefits of engaging in a tribute relationship was being able to trade and having access to uh, another country's uh, economy. But it's more than that. And that's where I don't want it to be viewed as simply a superficial, like a meaningless set of gestures that you go through until you can get down to the real business of trading. Trading was an important aspect, but the real business was in this affirmation of a diplomatic relationship between the two countries. Without that, uh, then the trading couldn't have taken place. But even if there was no trade, what was important was the establishment of, these, of this hierarchy. And think about it like this, right? And, and it, it may sound a little facetious, but it's not. Often if a new boy shows up on the playground, nobody knows where he fits in the hierarchy. So usually what they have to do is, you know, a couple fights, they figure out where he fits, then it's incredibly stable, usually, right? And once we, once we all know where we fit in the hierarchy, it's usually fairly stable. Part of this process is figuring out how these countries were going to interact with each other. And once they both agreed, then it was very stable, despite how much bigger one could be than the other. Right? It wasn't simply, well, China's big, it's going to beat up Korea. Once Korea had affirmed, okay, we're happy to be number two. You know, we tend to think of hierarchy as being very exploitative. But if you think about it another way, they were incredibly proud of how high up on the hierarchy they were. Countries now are very proud of how much English language they know, of how globalized they are, of their soft power. That's the same way. So once they had established this hierarchy, uh, relations tended to be very stable even if there was a real mismatch in power between the two. A result of that is what some have called the Pax Sinica, a long period of peace uh, under Chinese hegemony. But why didn't China actually push and take Korea, Vietnam? I mean, it was just there. I know. What did they have to lose by just taking it? And what's even more interesting about it, and this is why I think it's even more uh, uh, striking, is these are incredibly rich agricultural settled areas. I mean, you could have conquered them and really had a lot of benefit. What's really interesting is that China didn't conquer these countries. It, it just kept marching west a thousand miles over uh, sand dunes because the, what was the real threat to China was the, uh, these Mongols, these nomads. So part of the reason that they didn't take over these countries, though, comes down to the same reason that we don't, like America's not invading Canada. Why would they invade Canada? It's just another country. There's no threat. They're not Chinese. Why would we do that? We tend to start again from the idea that life is nasty, brutish, and short, and that the only thing to stop countries from falling in on each other like a pack of wild dogs is if someone's got a bigger stick than you. But you know what? The empirical record of the world isn't that way. Actually, there are far more stable relations among unequal countries than there is just complete random violence. In part, why is this? Why was it so stable? China could recognize in Korea and in Vietnam 
literally recognize what they were and what they were trying to do. They were engaged in a similar project, but it's also clear they weren't Chinese. I would actually put it the other way around. I don't think it's a surprise at all they didn't conquer them. Why would they? They're just there. They're, they're no threat, right? Who did they have the hardest time with? The groups that rejected everything about China, except the trade, right? So the Mongols or the nomads could occasionally have some kind of relations, and the Chinese tried everything to get stable relations with them. They tried offense, you know, sending missions, defense, the Great Wall. They would try tribute relations. But of course, the nomads, the various types of uh, Central Asian peoples, you might be able to make a temporary tribute relationship or diplomatic relationship with one small group, but it didn't work the way a country did. And the minute that leader would pass on or the, you know, the, the, the tribe would fall apart, boom, it was gone. You had to start all over again. So enduring relations were extremely difficult. And they only solved it by wiping out the nomads eventually after hundreds of years. So that was for the nom nomads at the north. Um, but what about the east borders, the maritime borders? Today we hear a lot about Dogdo Takeshima, the Sengaku Islands. What was happening there? Was there clear delimitation? And why do we still hear so much about it if things seem to be so codified? Yeah. Well, here's, here's one of the problems with the way we're thinking about these, these islands today. They're not a historical dispute. Back then, for Tokto or Senkakus or South China Seas, nobody cared about those rocks. In fact, the only people who cared about them were the sailors or the fishermen who tried to avoid them. Right? So, so it's not a historical issue. And why is it? They, they had no... I mean, it would, have been, it would have been impossible to make the argument to a Korean king or a Chinese emperor that... Uh, Way out there over the horizon where nobody lives, there's a couple of rocks that nobody can live on, and you should care about who owns them. It would have been baffling to him. What do you mean, right? What did they care about? Where people lived. So like Tsushima, they had to have extensive negotiations between Korea and Japan over who was Tsushima, uh, how did you get treated? Were they Japanese? They get treated under Japanese law and then have to have... Uh, access to Korea through the tribute system, or were they Korean, or were they a third party, and blah, blah, blah. And they ultimately decided they're Japanese. And that has been incredibly stable. I mean, they decided that back in like 14-something, I think, 1480 or 1490, they had a long decades of discussion about what they were, decided they're Japanese. From then on, okay, problem solved. They're Japanese. That's not an issue, even though Tsushima's really, literally right in the middle. <laughs> because with people, you have to decide who they are, because there's, again, there's practical reasons. How do you deal with their legacy? How do you deal with trade? How do you deal with legal issues? So historically, the maritime borders were actually fairly clear. You could go down to a beach. The big issue with maritime borders back then was piracy, wegu. Because, of course, many of these, as I said before, many of these trading slash pirate, uh, and when we think of pirates, it's not, again, it's better to think of a trading fleet, an armed trading fleet. This isn't like one, one boat. This is usually an entire village with... 30 or 40, you know, armed lorcas and everything else. I mean, this is massive fleets that would trade. Uh, and if trading was outlawed or if trading was difficult, then they would become pirates, which is essentially the same thing. And if the laws change, then they become traders again. But dealing with the... Uh, and we're, we still have problems with piracy today. I mean, genuine problems because it's extremely hard to control. Back then, that was what they cared about with the maritime borders, was dealing with the pirates. In the past 20 years, the rise of China has become a somewhat popular topic, to say the least, but opinions are obviously divided on the issue. A few years ago, you brought up the idea that China reaches back to its past for guidance to devise its new role in the region. Does that mean that China might now be trying to make an hegemonic comeback? You know, I think in some ways, yes. I'm not sure they can do it, though. And that's the key point that I want people to realize, right? In some ways, I think a China reaching back to a Confucian past, I mean, China's a civilization. China has a rich, deep, incredibly vibrant civilizational, cultural, philosophical history, a set of ideas and tools to draw on. The problem with China today is nobody believes in communism anymore. Nobody really believes, or let me put it another way. Communism came along and did everything it could to wipe out traditional what it considered feudal, backward, but traditional Chinese culture. They did everything they could to wipe it out. Then, Deng said, to get rich is glorious, and communism at least was a formulating ideology. And now that's wiped out. Nobody believes in it, right? So in China today, I would say, nobody really believes in anything. It's, 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 a, you know, it's sort of like whatever you can get away with. 
And you can see the debate going on. I mean, I think sort of a, a bitter, angry nationalism that's mad at Japan and the Western countries for the last 150 years is not much to build a uh, national identity on and a future forward-looking uh, set of values and beliefs. So you can see Xi Jinping trying to reach back into history and trying to make, make uh, claims about what China is and what they stand for, many of which are wonderful, wonderful values. Virtue, leaders should, be, leaders should be the best educated and set an example for the rest. I mean, that's deeply confusing, right? This could be actually very good. This has gotten a lot of people very mad because they think that China will try and uh, recreate the tribute system and et cetera, et cetera. I think on the one hand that China attempting to craft a set of beliefs about itself, a national identity that's based on its history is probably not a bad thing. I'm not sure they can actually do it because the world is totally different than it was. So I think there will always be some Confucian roots or some historical roots, which are just as Buddhist and everything else and Taoist in you know, Chinese history uh, that you can reach back to today. Uh, but the world is totally different. And so I don't think there's the slightest chance uh, that China can recreate a tribute system in modern world based on identical nation states, which are all formally equal. I don't see how you do it. What about South Korea? You wrote that because of its colonial past, South Korea has reinterpreted its subordinate relation to China as weakness or terrorism, and that to contract this, uh, a new historiography has been made that downplays its subordinate relationship to China yep. and plays up the Gokuryo kingdom um, that was in a situation more similar to what's happening now. Would that uh, rewriting of history actually affect the way South Korea today behaves with today's China? Um, I think in some ways, right? I mean, what you see in all these countries, it's, again, in Vietnam, it's a article of faith that we fought China, our whole history is fighting off China, which is completely false. It's nowhere, you know, there's one, maybe 14, 20, right? But the idea that there were hundreds and we just sent our century after century of fighting China is completely, it's a 20th century national identity in Vietnam written to explain Vietnam to its own people of fighting off the French and then the Americans and everything else. In Korea, it's the same way, right? Korea had had such stable, extraordinarily stable existence up until the 19th century. If, if you think about it, Korea essentially experienced maybe three wars in its entire known history, right? The, the unification of Shilla, which was Tang Dynasty in 670, 660 AD, where everybody was involved and, and eventually crushed Goguryeo. Then Im Jin Weiran, maybe you could call the Mongol passive, you know, three maybe, and then you get up to the 20th century, which is one reason Korea doesn't really have a whole lot of military heroes. There weren't a lot of wars going on. But the 20th century was totally different and totally uh, chaotic for Korea. And I, I find it interesting that like now we're, we're looking back to, oh, that was the macho kingdom. That was the macho one. We're not weak. Um, and it is now a chance for Korea to rewrite its own views with both Japan and China about the way, you know, sort of rewriting their, their relations with each other. The, I'm not sure how successful they're being, but you can clearly see Koreans trying to craft a much different history for them than they would have written if they'd written it 100 years ago. It seems that there's a pattern where Korea tends to be, to remain extremely loyal to the previous hegemon. During the Qing dynasty, they were extremely loyal to the Ming. Yeah. When the West and Japan were starting to rise in the 19th century, they were still very Loyalist. loyal to the Qing mm -hmm. and the Ming even more. So are we now likely to see Korea today remaining and being very loyal to the United States? Yeah, I mean, I would think so, right? And I would actually make two, two points about that. And this is another reason that whatever the, the present turns out to be, it won't look like the past. Uh, Japan is the same way, right? I mean, I, I, when I was writing uh, a different book, China Rising, I had a chapter titled, Japan is Not a Leader. And I got such pushback from my Japan scholar friends that I changed the title. I wish I had kept that title because that's really what I think, right? Japan does not naturally try and be the top of the hierarchy. They tried twice, 1592 and then the colonial era. Both were times when China was, was falling apart, was a power vacuum, it was weak, and both times failed miserably. Japan, after that, it's not like the minute that uh, they recovered from the Im Jin Weiran, they tried to invade again. It was 300 years before Japan decided to try and invade again. I mean, centuries, all right, fine. We'll just sort of stay here on the side. After they lost the Pacific War, 
you know, a sort of 50 year attempt to be the leader in Asia that failed miserably. Okay, fine, we'll be number two, USA. An instant turnabout. So I think, I think you know, in some ways there is uh, something interesting about that. Korea tends to be very loyal. Korea right now, no question. What I would say Korea right now views is this. Korea does not view China as a threat. Korea can live with China. I think that's very clear. But they view America as their friend. And they view China as a country that they can live with and they know how to live with. But I think they feel much closer to the United States. What does that mean for the future of East Asia? Are we seeing more likely a future of conflict or of cooperation coming up? <laughs> I actually think it will be more cooperative. I know that's not popular to say. You sound much more macho if you say I'm very worried. Uh, I'm very, very worried. But here's why, right? China, I don't see China invading anybody. The only country, China threatens the, the national survival of only one country, and that's Taiwan. And they have their own issues. But I don't, I don't know anyone responsible who says that a China may actually try and invade a Japan or a Korea or a Vietnam or a Malaysia, right? No. Nobody actually fears for their national survival from China which means the issue is different than it was with Japan 100 years ago. One country is feared for their survival. Right? You might disappear. Given that that is pretty much off the table and China has made it very clear, and we know that China can live with these countries, it's a process of working out in a modern system a set of hierarchic relationships for how are they going to deal with each other when China is, by, is now by far the most powerful country in the region, but is not the most vibrant cultural beacon in the region. It doesn't have the soft power that it used to have 100, you know, 200 years ago. So there's, they have to sort it out differently now, where China is incredibly rich and powerful, but is not the center of civilization. To conclude, what do you think is the most important lesson we should learn from East Asia's history? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, a, great, that's a great question to, uh, to ask. And I think that the most important question, uh, lesson that we should learn is this. East Asian countries have their own histories, their own cultures, their own identities that have been deeply influenced by the West, but they are not Western countries. And I think uh, particularly for Americans, we keep expecting these Asian countries to act the way we, we would, and they don't. They share some of our concerns, they share some of our beliefs, but they don't share them all. And if we want to understand what's making this region tick, we need to be able to understand where they came from as well as where they are today. Professor David Kang, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. It's a uh, wonderful to be here. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.